Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to this Guernsey Literary Festival event with Christy Watson. Thank you to the private donor who's made it possible for Health Connections to sponsor this event, which was actually scheduled for last year um, and who's very generously agreed to be the sponsor again this year. Today's talk is chaired by Bella Farrell, CEO of Health Connections, and I'd like to thank her for stepping in at the last minute, as unfortunately Karen Leach, who was due to chair this talk today, is unfortunately unwell. So thank you very much. This event is being live streamed, so if you're joining us from home, you can take part in the Q&A sessions using the chat function online. Christy Watson was a registered nurse for 20 years. She spent most of her career in paediatric intensive care in large NHS hospitals before becoming a resuscitation officer, which involved teaching and clinical work on hospital-wide crash teams. Her first novel, Tiny Sunbirds, Far Away, won the Costa First Prize Novel Award, and her second novel, Where Women Are Kings, was also published to international critical acclaim. Her non-fiction book, The Language of Kindness, was published in 2018 and was a number one Sunday Times bestseller. It was a book of the year in the Evening Standard, New Statesman, The Times, The Guardian and The Sunday Times. It's been translated into 23 languages and spent five months in the Sunday Times top 10 bestseller lists. It's been adapted for theatre and television and I believe the first live theatre production is due to start imminently. Her second non-fiction book, The Courage to Care, is a vital and timely book about inspirational nurses and the bravery of patients and families. Chris Evans has described her latest book as the handbook for compassion, a must-read book. Christy was awarded an honorary Doctor of Letters for her con contribution to nursing and the arts by the University of East Anglia. She is patron of the Royal College of Nursing Foundation. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Bella to welcome Christy. Thank you. Hello, Christy. See me. Hi. 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 You? You're the stranger I, I have yet to meet and to become a friend. And uh, I'm so excited to be here. And I just want to acknowledge that I know Karen would have done an absolutely fantastic job of interviewing you as our lead community nurse on Guernsey. And I hope that Karen feels better soon. Um, I have to say, though, Karen, I'm just absolutely thrilled to be able to step up. I would have loved to have met you in person, Christy. So I haven't had time to read your book because I've only got uh, heard about um, you know, being in this position less than 10 hours ago, but I, I read a lot of it overnight. And, uh, <laughs> I, and I managed to, in my mind, instead of being nervous about being here, I managed to think I was on the red eye again. <laughs> and now we've just rocked up at a cafe uh, and we're about to meet and chat about writing and your amazing books and your um, career as a nurse, which makes me feel very small um, because I think you're a bit of a giant of a of a woman and a nurse and a writer. And I'm really interested to know who you are and what matters to you most. Wow, well, thank you so much for such a lovely introduction and for stepping in at the very last minute. I really do appreciate it and hope you get better soon as well, Karen. Um, and what a great opening question. So um, what matters to me most, I guess, um, has always been the same, but I've been reflecting on that a lot in the last year, as I think we all have during this terrible time. And I think that uh, what matters to me most is, is my friends and family. And, uh, and it's been a time when we've all been acutely aware of those things that are the most important to all of us, which are not the things perhaps that we held valuable before the cult of youth and beauty external beauty and things like stuff and consumerism and globalization and now we're all looking a bit more inwardly at kindness and compassion and community and families and and, and our loved ones and so that's what i've always been around about i think but much more acutely aware of it aware of it now after the last the last year and a bit 
Thank you. And I'm aware that you've talked about um, connection with friends and family there. Can you tell me a little bit how you have used stories to talk about that connection that's so important? It's interesting because as a writer, I've often thought and wondered about the themes that I write about. They're never conscious. They're just the things that you carry as a human being that automatically subconsciously come out in your creative work, I think. And I had an interview last week um, and the journalist uh, quite helpfully said he, he'd read all my all my books to date and whether it was fiction or non-fiction, he said it's very interesting that the themes that come out in all my writing are, are those of family and survival. And I said, oh, thanks. I've never really known what my themes were. <laughs> I think they are they are about family and survival and so I think I explore those things because they're important to me, but also because I think exploring them in different mediums. So for example, in fiction and non and theater and television and looking at them through slightly different lenses adds a deeper understanding of what those things mean. And um, when I've wrote Tiny Sunbirds Far Away, um, and uh, there was another writer writing very similar story that I was quite worried about. I think when you're a new novelist, you really worry that someone else is going to write the same book. And of course, that never happens because we all have our own themes and our own way of writing is completely different to everybody else's way of writing because our own psychology is completely different. But I was really concerned that the same two books would appear at the same time and they were totally different, but had the same kind of story, the same ideas. And um, I remember that my book was described in the press as a, a domestic drama and his was a political thriller. And that really interested me because they were essentially the same story, but they were presented through a very gendered lens. So for a long time, although I've been writing about family, I think I've avoided talking about the fact that I write about family because I was somehow worried that it would be perceived as less important, less academic, less interesting than perhaps other times of other types of writing. But now I'm very proud to be writing about that domestic space because I think it is political. It is really important. And it's the space that connects every single human being across the globe. So those are my are the things that I'm passionate about. And, and it's interesting that you say that, Christy, because just in the few hours that I've been reading your book, The Courage to Care, the bits that have really popped out at me, I mean, as an ex-nurse myself, I can see all the nursing scenarios, but the bits that I really related to were the bits when you talked about your relationship with your children. I have three teenagers. The relationship with your brother is an older sister when you bribed him with an acid tablet, giving him an acid tablet, in fact, when he was 14. Um, to, so that you so that you could get away with doing the dishes and he would do them or you know just uh, talking to your dad and telling him about that before he passed away and then wanting to tell your dad your deeper darker secrets because I believe life was fairly messy for you as a teenager and uh, your dad saying no 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 don't tell me anymore those stories are between you and the moon um, so um, we've all got those stories but um, I, I love the fact that you are candid about life is messy because life is messy for everybody. And I think we've been so good at taking off um, the mask of how we look and talking now about the, the, the real f person behind the mask in COVID. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the really messy parts of your life? Pretend I'm your dad for a minute. Don't don't keep it. Don't don't not you in the moon. You and us. Tell us tell us a few more stories about about that messy life and how you might have actually learned from from those and how maybe in the future you you um, now embrace messiness rather than avoid it. It's interesting how. Um yeah, I've been thinking a lot about this mask that we've had to put on for COVID, but has enabled us to take off another mask, a metaphorical. We've put a literal mask on and taken our metaphorical masks off, which I find really interesting. Um, and that space where something has forced us to confront um, 
the image of humanity has reflected back at us. And I increasingly have no interest in looking at shiny representations of human, human beings on social media or whatever, because it, it just seems, dishonest is, is too strong a word, but it just seems boring because I know it's not the true person. And I think that nursing and being in a family and just being human it is about learning that it's when we are most vulnerable that we're most interesting. And of course, that's quite a scary place to be. So I think that appreciating, acknowledging the messy magic of who we are can be quite a terrifying thing, particularly when you're younger, particularly when I was younger. But as I as I get older and more and more, I'm appreciating that it's our brokenness that connects all of us, every single one of us. Um, I won't be sharing any more of my messy life stories with you because it's live streaming around the world. But I'm sure if we meet in person and have a cup of tea, I will fill you in, Bella. No problem at all. <laughs> but I do, I do get where you're coming from. And I think the very interesting, um, most important things for me as, as I reflect on the last uh, terrible year of years that we've had, but also reflect on my own life is that the more open and honest and broken and vulnerable that I am with other people, the more honest and open and broken and vulnerable they are back to me. And that's the relationship, those are the relationships I want. That's the intimacy I'm looking for. And that feels like the most human space that we can all live in and the most honest space that we can all live in. Absolutely. It's that authenticity, I think, which allows us all to live in our flow comfortably and not to be freaked out by the things that come at us, but just to embrace all of that uncertainty and to have faith and trust. And you talk about that in your book, having faith and trust in adversity and uh, not, not, not trying to plan it and sort it and tidy it, and, but just to sit with it. And, and, and I, I appreciated that so much, I, and that resonated with me. And I, I know it'll resonate with the, the audience of very real people here in front of us, lots of nurses and teachers and volunteers and people who are in the community. And, I, and I'm sure they're all going to be so excited to read about your book. Um, so you were a nurse for um, many years, a paediatric nurse, and I'm, I'm absolutely delighted that in the audience as well, we've got the new consultant community paediatrician, Amma Oprang. Welcome to Guernsey, Amma. Um, because Christy, of course, you're a paediatric nurse. Um, the question is, what, what, um, what made you want to write after, after that uh, time in nursing? So I think I always wanted, well, I always read is, is the honest truth. I read everything. I was really precocious. Teen. I just read absolutely everything as a child. And um, to the extent that I would read the phone books, if you can remember, the old big phone books that used to thud onto the doorstep. <laughs> um, and quite weirdly, I'd memorized the phone numbers as well, which is very odd. Um, but I'd always read and absorbed as much information as I possibly could. And I, I guess I always, was a storyteller. I was always interested in story and it was storytelling and story that got me really interested in nursing, I think, as well. And when I started nursing at the age of 17, I was around nurses for the first time and, and just these incredible relationships that they were having with patients and their families and the stories that I was hearing just seemed so profound and such a privilege to listen to and bear witness to. Um, but I think uh, the writing didn't happen until I was on maternity leave with my daughter, who is now 16. And for the first time ever, I had time off and I had time on maternity leave. And she slept all the time, which uh, people get jealous of, but she really did as a baby. She slept all the time. It was amazing. <laughs> she still does, actually. But um, while she was asleep, I started writing and then I did a, a creative writing beginners class just to get out of the house, really. And it was at that creative writing class that I 
wrote a short story, first thing I'd ever written creatively, and the short story, the tutor of the group said, I think you should do an MA. I think this is really good. You'd be good at it. And so I sent it off on a whim. I just Googled MA creative writing and sent it off to UEA because that was the first place that came up and managed to get in. I managed to get in and I got a bursary and won a scholarship. And so I did that while I was carrying on nursing. And I won, um, uh, the, the short story became a novel and the novel won the Costa First Novel Prize. So it's sort of the stuff of dreams, really, how I fell into writing in the same way that I fell into nursing, partly by accident, but it just suited me. And I was incredibly lucky uh, with how things went for me. But I just found another passion, lifelong passion, and and found people, found another tribe. And I've always found my tribe with nurses and doctors and allied health professionals. And writing is another tribe that I fit. And so to be able to find two groups of communities that I absolutely love being around felt like I'd been blessed. And that was amazing and still is amazing. And that's been the greatest part of writing, really, and nursing is the people. As it often is, it, it, it's the people that, that keeps us going, the relationships, yes, absolutely, and the connections between these people who are sometimes different to the relationship you have with them. It's interesting. Um, you talk about nursing and writing coming from the same place, and Christy, I wonder if you can expand on that for us. For me, it's, it's about story. We're all flesh and bones and blood and we're all story and it's the stories that connect us and I've been thinking because now part of my job is as a professor of medical and health humanities at UVA it's been full circle I'm back there now as a professor but I've been thinking a lot about how to incorporate art into medicine and and why that's so important and I think the reason it's so important is because people's stories have become increasingly important in healthcare. And that is partly because we're understanding that more, but it's also because the landscape of our suffering has changed and people are suffering existentially. We understand that cure at all costs is not only not possible, but not desirable often as well. And so our medical model of care hasn't really changed all that much, but the nature of suffering and the nature of our patients has changed beyond belief. And I'm sure you all know from your nursing career that when we started out, it was very feasible to get somebody coming in with a, a single problem, just one problem. They'd come in with diabetes, they'd get their insulin sorted out and then they'd go home. People come in now with 17 comorbidities, they've got social care factors, there's emotional stuff going on, there's mental illness, um, there's all kinds of issues that people are having and struggling with and facing, whether that's poverty, housing, um, anxiety, or, or loneliness, all kinds of issues. And so giving um, giving people just treating them for one single issue isn't really helping the, the big picture. And I think because of the nature of that, our, our need for understanding people's stories has become as vital as understanding pharmacology, for example. And the way to understand people's stories and the way to understand our own stories and make sense of it all is through art. And so for me, storytelling, writing, all the arts, all the humanities, all the sciences, nursing, medicine, they're all part of the same thing. They're part of us really being able to actively listen to what somebody is telling us with words or without. And I think that's what that's what we all need, but particularly in healthcare, that's what people need right now. And I love that you talk about people um, rather than patients or service users. And I love that you draw attention to the social model of health and the, so the determinants of health, poverty and housing and so forth. And of course, we, you know, um, I'm really conscious in that last little bit you talked about um, almost, and I'm drawn back to Cheryl who nursed your dad uh, and her ability to anticipate somebody's needs without them before they, 
they were uh, they articulated it themselves and we know that nurses who are experts in observation and nonverbal communication and, and anticipating what needs and just doing that little touch that makes such a difference in somebody's life. Can you talk a little bit about anticipation in nursing and how maybe in your writing you're anticipating some of the more political things that are going to come out of COVID, like the lack of nursing voice at SAGE, or indeed we had it here, the lack of nursing presence in our media um, briefings. So, you know, anticipating what might be there for nurses in the future, is that something you will write more about? So, I think, um, I don't even think we're an I'm necessarily anticipating what nurses need in the future, more trying to shout very loudly about what nurses need right now, <laughs> uh, which is appropriate pay for the level of skill and expertise that they have, a, a voice in policy, a voice in government. And the sage thing that I write about in The Courage to Care, it, it really astonishes me that we have a, an advisory committee of experts and scientists, but no nurse on that committee. And particularly I'm thinking about a care home nurse. There's nobody more expert in care homes than a care home nurse, none. There's nobody more expert in infection control and PPE than an infection control nurse. Infection control nurses have spent their entire careers thinking about PPE. And I, and I do strongly believe that had there been an expert nurse who was talking about the practical applications of the modeling and the statistics, then lives would have been saved. So I think I'm not even anticipating what's going to happen in the future. I'm almost looking back and saying, well, that we should be doing that right now. And I think, I think people ask me a lot about the very far future of nursing. And it's quite hard to, it's quite hard to know what will happen in nursing. Um, but we know that nursing and nursing, the nursing profession all over the world is in trouble in terms of numbers, in terms of people being retained. I'm not even talking about recruitment, but retention is a massive issue. And we've got an older workforce who are, a third of them are considering leaving the profession. There were 40,000 nurses short in England before the pandemic started. And so there is a sort of crisis unraveling right now um, but yeah, that anticipation that nurses have, that understanding is, is another interesting thing that I thought a lot about, um, because nurses are, have a bird's eye view of everything that's going on with their patient, the family they're caring for, the situation, the, the bed numbers on the ward, the staffing ratios, who's having a bad day because they've had an argument with their spouse or, you know, they know everything that's happening and that is invisible. So it's hard to describe the importance of it. But they also, there is quite a lot of research actually now about the nursing sixth sense. I don't know if you've read it, but there's, there's nursing intuition is actually a well-researched fact. <laughs> so I used to say there was one nurse I worked with on pediatric intensive care and she would go into the wall and just immediately walk over to the patient who was about to have some sort of emergency. And I was in awe of this nurse. I just thought that was uh, quite spooky, a little bit creepy, <laughs> but also amazing and incredible. And I was like, well, that's good. Cool. Um, but she definitely had some sort of sixth sense intuition about who was going to go off. And we, we all have those stories from nursing. Um, but I think now people are realizing that actually that's based on fact. It's based on experience. It's based on many, many years of having this bird's eye view and this anticipation combined with all the technical and skill that people have been taught. So it is quite, I find it fascinating and really important. I find it fascinating listening to you um, because um, when I was nursing in the early 90s and went on to be a midwife and did my master's in health service management, my dissertation was on motivation of NHS 
employees and I looked particularly at retention and recruitment of NHS staff and I'm just horrified to think that all of my recommendations, you know, they're just so relevant and even more um, relevant today and not much has changed, things have go, gone backwards. And I know that uh, I was so interested in intuition and we studied the science of nursing and yet there was the art of nursing and the fact that really if I'd done a PhD I would have wanted to study the intuition of nursing. So it's just great to hear you talk about this thing and we're not witches and it's a mainstream conversation. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm, I noticed that I, I want to bring it back to writing, but I do want to pick up on the fact that you didn't particularly approve of clapping for carers. You thought we should be giving people a pay rise uh, who are caring for others. Absolutely. Can we all clap for that? <laughs> <laughs> We're with you on Guernsey with that. Absolutely. Thank um, you. You know, let's just put it there. Um, <laughs> But um, going back to your writing, um, you write both fiction and non-fiction. Can you describe the difference in the process? Yeah, so I, I, I always imagined myself as a novelist, a storyteller. I like being in that, I like thinking in abstraction and being in that really creative, imaginative space. And it's a kind of madness, right, but a beautiful madness. Um, and you do live in a fictional world that you've created. So I got to the stage when I was writing Tiny Sunbirds where I was dreaming in this place that I'd made with the characters that I'd made up. And it stopped when I stopped writing the book and I really missed those dreams. So um, I've got a psychiatrist friend actually who has a lot of a lot to say about my, my process because <laughs> it's a fine line between <laughs> I think having it, you know, I went to an event where um, the, they were talking about psychosis and they said you know do you hear voices do you make up people that aren't there do you have delusions do you see things that aren't there and I was thinking yes 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 <laughs> this is my job it requires it of me um, but I do love that whole space and then when I started writing non-fiction this, I realized my, my, my failures, the bits that I struggle with the most and the bits that I find really hard, that I'd been avoiding in fiction. And, and that was structure, plot, architecture of the thing. And in fiction, some novelists that I know tend to make really detailed plans about everything that's going to go in the book. I don't make any plans at all. I just start writing and see what happens. And the characters always come through me. Sometimes I'm quite surprised at something one of my characters has done when I read it back and I can't even remember writing. Like, oh, I didn't expect that you would do that. Fine, that can stay in. Um, but in nonfiction, you have to structure. So in fiction, just let it go. But in nonfiction, you have to spend a long time thinking about structure and architecture planning, and it has to be meticulously organized. And those are the things that I struggle with a lot and I still struggle with those things and so I, I find non-fiction I've learned a lot about those things that I found really really difficult but I think and I'm writing two more non-fiction books now I'm contracted to write two more but my heart is fiction I think I think my long-term love will be fiction because I like living in the space where it consumes me and it's all I can think about. And you don't get that so much with nonfiction because it's it's truth, it's fact, it's your life. You know it already. <laughs> and I so imagine those are the when, differences. Thank you, Christy. And I imagine when you're writing nonfiction as a nurse with your background in reflective practice that it's almost quite therapeutic to, to, to write it, almost journaling. Um, I'm interested in um, having two daughters of the audience here who are 15 and almost 18, and I'm not allowed to point them out or even refer to them by oh. name. Um, but you have two teenagers yourself. Um, I'm not sure that you adopted both your children, but I, I know that you adopted your son. At, and um, But I do know that you're um, writing a book with your 15-year-old daughter. Now, that's 16, really fascinating. 16. Yeah. Yeah. T t t t tell us about that. So How does I'm that work? currently writing a book. Uh, I'm currently writing a book before that. Um, the book I'm writing at the moment is about being at midlife, being in your 40s as a woman and 
perimenopause. So that's really great because that's kind of something that um, came as a massive shock to me. I had a huge what I thought was a breakdown and then discovered it was perimenopause. So I'm sure I'm I'm not alone in that. Um, so I'm writing that book first, and then once that's finished, I'm moving book with with my daughter. Um, and that came about uh, last year during lockdown. We started having lots of conversations. Uh, partly because we were we were locked in together, but also I think we had time for the first time to not be so hurried and rushed and busy in our own world and doing our own thing. And we started talking about absolutely everything and talking about it, but quite astonished at the the division between us in our points of view. And uh the more we started talking, the more we really listened to each other and the more we learned from each other and came to some sort of understanding about really big subjects. And so the idea is that we will have a conversation about something. I'll write the conversation up and then we'll both write an essay responding to that particular conversation. And it will be things like mental health, uh, gender, sexuality, race. All the all the juicy stuff, all the good stuff that everyone's talking about. But I was very interested in the idea that in this very polarized world where we do seem to have a massive generational divide at the moment in all things. I think last year for me was a really great learning in that she has lots of things that she can teach me and I have lots of things that I can teach her. And maybe there are other mothers and daughters or fathers and sons who have similar similar experiences and maybe even if it's a even a starting point for people having conversations that are difficult in their own families between their own generations then I think that would be a really valuable thing to do but also it means that we get to write a book together and that just feels like such a special special space but ask me in six months and I might have a very different um, idea about <laughs> what that's been like <laughs> Christy, your your children have uh, you've you've said in your book that uh, your children have taught you the courage to care. What do you what do you mean by that? So I was really um, last year, like many people, I rejoined the emergency COVID nineteen register and went back to clinical nursing. And it was a it was a big decision for me, primarily I think because I'm a single parent. And at that time, at the very first peak, I only went back for a short time, but during the first peak, I think everybody, you know, it felt apocalyptic. It felt end of life stuff, end of world stuff. We didn't know if we were going to go and catch this thing. We didn't know if, as healthcare workers, we were going to go there, um, go and die. And, and, you know, every single healthcare worker that I know had these feelings during those very early days of this might, this might not be good for all of us. And, um, and so I had real... I kept getting asked if I would go back to clinical work and particularly having been a critical care nurse for so many years, these were the skills that we were significantly short of. And um, I didn't, I felt terrified. I felt absolutely petrified and frightened as I'm sure everyone did. And I spoke to the kids about it for a long time and, and expected them to have lots of questions and, lots of thoughts about it. And I almost expected them to say, don't do it, mum. But they immediately, both of them said, you've got to go and do this and you've got to help and you've got to, and we want you to. And it was a no brainer for them. They just had the most stoic, brave courage. Again, the courage of younger people now really inspires me. I think this generation of teens that are coming up are really powerful, knowing their own minds and, we can learn so much from them, but they were absolutely full of courage and their courage and conviction gave me, I don't, I wouldn't say courage because I still felt absolutely terrified, but it gave me the permission to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. And it feels like if you're saying it's the right thing to do, then it's probably the right thing to do. And there's a lovely um, passage in the book when you describe uh, that, uh, you know, walking across the bridge and I assume uh, you've got Westminster, um, the Houses of Parliament behind you and I presume you're going towards Thomas's and a, an old nurse friend greets you and you, you, I, 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 just the way you describe that, um, I don't, 
I, I almost want you to read it from the book, but we've got such little time and I know people will buy the book and read it, but you were like a mad woman running across that bridge. It was like as if, you know, you were so compelled and, and the podcast I've listened to, you had this, this calling. Uh, you had done your will the night before, uh, after your day's work, which went from seven o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock at night, and you had scrubbed yourself and, uh, you know, put your clothes in a hot wash. And uh, it was only after that, 13 hours, your 15-year-old decided to be your cook and produce dinners for you and could give you a, that one hug that you could have every day to sustain you. Um, I'm almost speechless with... Um, a, yeah. Can we just... <laughs> and... Um, you know, because I, I did have a conversation with my chair, Louise. Can I go and nurse in England again? And Louise said, you know, Health Connections has work to do here. We were connecting people who were isolated to support, and we did some great stuff. But I think every nurse had that pull in us. Can you tell us what it was like between 7 o'clock in the morning and 9 o'clock, very briefly? Um, because, again, you know, I know that talking about nursing is something that we can all read about, and this is a literary festival, but I think in order for us to connect to your writing, it would just be lovely to have a, a moment of what the reality was like for you. I think, um, I think that like all writers, everything I have to say, I write about it, or I don't want to talk about it, if that makes sense. And I think with COVID and particularly being, uh, it, lots of people asked me to write about the pandemic and what the reality was like. And for me, it, fe it felt and feels too soon. But what I did write about and what I'm very happy to write about and I have written about since is that pull that you talked about so beautifully. And that from, calling is a controversial, contra Virtual sentiment. Nursing profession is very split between people that say, absolutely not, this is not vocational, this is a job, and others who say, this is more than a job. And I think both things can happen at the same time. They're not binary. Um, but what what was what was very, very clear to me during those hours and during that time when I was um uh, working, uh, I worked on a compassionate care team, but what what was really apparent was the teamwork and the incredible colleagues that I was lucky enough to stand next to for a short time. And for me, that was the pull. The pull was I get to stand next to people like yourself, people like the nurses in the room there, these incredible humans even for a short time, I just want to stand beside them in this enormous thing that's going on. And we got told, uh, you know, that your your one purpose is to sex as possible. And it very quickly became apparent that we weren't able to do it. Um, I have her number. She gave it to me yesterday. <laughs> While um, the guys are getting it back, it's not quite as bad as yesterday morning in the OGH. We were all sitting there and uh, the minister's question times. And we had no speaker on the screen. So whatever's happened just now, at least we've seen Christy's face. And I uh, know that the guys, if they can't get the screen back, will get her telephone line and we and carry on talking to her. It soon is question time um, in about a few more minutes. Um, what happened yesterday was interesting. Um, I was what? Have I lost my volume too? No. And uh, Claire rang me, the festival director, and said that um, Karen was unwell. Could I step in? And the next thing came along, an email with Karen's questions. And then I sort of um, thought, right, I must give Karen's questions um, absolute um, priority and then along came um, a sense of oh um, I, I'm not sure I would be in flow with somebody else's questions and that might not be quite so natural and engaging so um, I do want to apologize to Karen because I know you'll be looking at home that these are not all, all your questions Karen but what I do think um, from looking at your questions and from having a brief conversation with Christy is that 
if, if I can keep her number for the GDPR reasons, because you know, it'll be an invite to come back to Guernsey and to perhaps talk to the nurses who are nowhere in this room. I know Sharon Tracy's ho hopefully here somewhere. Sharon, excellent. Um, Sharon's um, the lead breast care nurse and lead and compassion at care, compassionate care at the PH. And I know that she's the sort of person I could ask, can I give your number to Sharon and you and Karen can invite her over. And can you imagine um, if we could really make com um, com put compassion rather than empathy or any of those other words, but compassion compassionate, uh, being compassionate towards our nurses so that they can be compassionate to other people. Because I only nursed for 10 years and I had compassion fatigue. I have no idea how people carry on nursing and without being properly cared for themselves. And what can we do as a community to care for our healthcare professionals? And it's more than pay, it's recognition, it's ringing them up and making sure that their food is delivered if they've had a 12 hour shift. It's giving them free membership at our gyms. It's making sure that, I mean, Sharon, can I just ask you as a nurse, what would, what would it um, take to really make you feel that you can carry on delivering the care that you give to our women who have breast cancer every day in a more compassionate way. Hi, I think it's, oh, sorry. Hi, I think it's just exactly like Chrissy said and yourself, Bella. It's, it's something we're very aware of and that we're doing at the PH now is our Schwartz rounds and Chrissy's probably aware of that and they do it nationally. And that's us looking at supporting each other and being compassionate towards each other so that we don't get burnt out. So we share our stories and actually in a very non-judgmental, confidential environment that's not problem solving. And that allows us to listen to each other's stories and realise that actually our jobs are really hard and we do need to look after ourselves. And sometimes it can be easy, the things that we don't talk about in the masks, is to not look after ourselves well, like doing things that are not particularly good for us, which burns us out. And we're more aware now of like being mindful, talking to each other, and maybe swimming, exercising, doing all the things that keep us healthy and actually caring for our, each other so that we can then prevent us from being burnt out. And then, uh, then in, in turn, allows us to deliver much more personal, uh, person-centered, compassionate personal care. care. And, and I think just listening to Chrissy and everything that she's saying and, and things that you're saying, Bella, and the things that we do in Guernsey as a community, mm -hmm. and I think nationally, and we're trying to internationally as things change, we are becoming much more connected in a way that we share our feelings and we and maybe become much more involved with our families and with patients and their families or, or people in their families. So, um, yeah, I, I think that, I think just being, People being compassionate towards me allows me to be compassionate towards others and me looking after myself. So I think that if that answers your question. Thank you, Sharon. I'm, I'm really proud of you for leading on compassion. I, I was drawn to a, a, an article in here, um, in, in Christie's book, um, where the hospital management decided to care for the nurses so uh, during uh, COVID. So they put on uh, yoga classes and on the corridors, they told the nurses where the yoga classes would be and the meditation and the breathing mindfulness classes. And uh, when Christy walked past the posters a week later, it was, I didn't have time to pee in a 12 hour shift, namaste. <laughs> you know, and uh, I remember, uh, you know, I remember that feeling running between patients and uh, it's really hard. How can the hospital here and our politicians, um, has any nurses any thought of Sharon once you've got the mic, is there anything that our, our politicians who, and our senior uh, HSE officers can do more of to support nurses locally? Be political. Yeah. Be open. doesn't think, matter. It's a safe environment. I we don't think, care that it's viral. <laughs> Hopefully some of them are listening. I think, um, and Karen and I had a conversation about this the other day as we sort of go forward with a new sort of healthcare structure. And and I think it's it's really about, the from the top and the organisation, reaching the coalface, reaching the people that are that don't have time to pee 
and, and don't have time to go to meetings and, and listen to all the stuff that's happening at a strategic level, I think it's reaching down and touching the people that are working really hard. And, and those people that are working really hard and don't have time to pee, the organisation needs to acknowledge that and support them. And I think we're moving towards that with things like Schwartz rounds and things like that where... But it's really difficult because, as, as Chrissy said, about retention of staff and the turnover of staff and trying to recruit nurses. And it needs to be, I think, felt that nurse, nurses are valued. And, and, and in, in the UK, you can see that they've worked so hard and been scared to go to work that you might die. And then you get given a 1% pay rise. You know, like, you just feel, like, slapped down, not recognised. And, and I can totally see where clapping it's just got no significant it has no bearing on how a nurse feels in those situations terrified to go home in case you give COVID to your family and 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 there'll be so much post-traumatic stress and you can see why people are leaving but I think managers and organ and like heads of politicians need to listen to nurses and and we need to have a voice and they need to hear what it's like on the coal face and come in and see some of the work that we're doing and we're highly skilled and compassionate um and and i think that's under recognized sometimes particularly with politicians so absolutely thank you sharon for your time i'm just going to go back to read an excerpt of christie's book oh we've got a clap for sharon <laughs> i'm just going to go back now and read an excerpt of um from Christie's book, um, need my glasses for this. I think it's absolutely. Um, it. I'm, I'm actually a quite. Anybody who knows me, I'm an opinionated person. Um, there's a bit of a laugh there from the front. Um, and with the opinions come a little bit of judgment. And one of the things that Christie did, and I can't wait to get her back on, but we may and we may not. Um, to ask her more about this is that uh, in the courage of care, other th instead of the language of kindness, which was just the stories in her hospital where she worked, in the courage of care, she travelled around the country uh, to meet the, the, the great nurses that were doing fantastic work. Those were nurses in prisons, uh, nurses in schools, uh, nurses in the community. And um, one of the things that I'm accused of being, by my children mainly, is judgy too judgy and uh, I absolutely love the fact that the kindest nurse in England um, said that um, she was too, hopefully I can find it now, she was too busy caring to judge, she was too busy loving to judge and this ability to step in somebody else's shoes in a non-judgmental way and uh, Christy writes about that beautifully um, but when she meets uh, Jill who cares about the inmates and about inequality she learns that from him that 27 percent of prisoners have been looked after in the care system she learns that black men are 26 percent more likely than white men to be remanded in custody she says, as a mother, Christy says, as a mother of a black son who was previously looked after in care, I find these statistics truly shocking and horrifying. As a human being, I find them sh truly shocking and horrifying. As a nurse, sadly, I'm not remotely surprised. Even in nursing, the inequalities are vast, and nurses daily see the division and the inequality in our society and the people hidden from view the people cared for, regardless of all else, by Jill and nurses like him. I meet so many inspirational nurses, and I find them in unusual places. And I wonder whether nurses here also find the inequalities. I know that 20 years ago, I came here as a privileged person with a husband who had a privileged job, and if it wasn't for going into the healthcare system as a nurse with my very first patient, who after his baby was born at 18 was going back into prison for having kicked somebody on the street the weekend before. And knowing as a midwife that I did that attachment parenting was so important, um, I find that absolutely horrifying that the system thought that that was a 
a good way to turn that family around. Um, and, and nurses, I think, we've, al we've always had this uh, bird's eye view, as Christy has said, into, and we see the inequalities and the injustices. And as Sharon has just said, we, we should use our voices more. I wonder if actually more of us could, could write down and be the people who write regularly into our press and on our social media and be brave and courageous and tell those real stories of what it is like for real people living in our community. Um, would you like me to uh, open up questions to the audience? I think we're just about to be able to rejoin with Christy, so hopefully we can go to audience questions when she rejoins us in a minute. I think she's rejoining us now. Excellent. Christy, I think we're just about to join you again, and, uh, and I'm sorry about that uh, interlude. <laughs> Hi, and thank you so much. I hope you can hear me all right. I had two different computers open, so I wasn't sure what happened, but um, I had a slight technological freak out, as, as we've all had this year, I'm sure. But um, can you hear me? So, Christy, um, thank you for coming back. And I'm sorry, you didn't need that on your Saturday morning. Um, we're just going to ask you some questions now, if that's OK, and open up to the Guernsey audience, who've been very engaged and uh, probably very in awe of you who are living in England, as you say, still through the COVID crisis, um, not out of it like we're feeling. And of course, now you've got the Indian variant coming along and there's a question mark even going forward, what's going to happen? So um, we're probably very intrigued to know more about your thoughts on various things. Have we got any questions? Oh, we've got a lot of questions. Um, Dave. Sorry, before you, we've got a lady. Oh, sorry, hi. Hi, hi, Christy, how's it going? Um, listen, my question is, like, for, um, as, like, aspiring um, healthcare, like, I'm, I'm, I'm a biomedical scientist, and I'm writing a book about my experiences and stuff, working in the lab, um, and I'm just wondering, like, what advice you would give to aspiring healthcare workers writing nonfiction on how to get published? Oh, God. Meant to ask that anyway. Okay, that's a really good question. I'm just checking that you can hear me all right. Can just about hear you. Can you hear me? Because the screen has frozen again. Uh, can, can everyone hear me? About, okay. I think, Christy, if we can use your voice, um, um, you just so carry my, on. Yeah. yeah. My advice. Uh, Okay. My advice um, would always be uh, to write every day if you possibly can. I think get, getting into a habit, it's a bit like a muscle. If you, if you use your muscle regularly, whatever muscle that is, then the muscle will grow. And I think creativity and learning a craft is exactly the same. The most important advice I can give for any, uh, any future writer of a need in books, and I think read, 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 write, 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 is what what well, every, every writer would advise somebody starting out. In, in terms of practical advice, some people like doing courses, some people don't. I think there are lots and lots of courses available online now, which is, it does open things up internationally. There are lots of good courses um, and you can Google them, but there's also something called the Writers and Artists Yearbook. And that's got all the information about agents, publishers, courses, lots of practical advice. So I would just say, do the research, um, but write, 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 and read, read, read. And I think, don't do what I did. Don't follow my advice for myself, which is when I started writing, after I'd written about a page, I started fantasizing about what I would wear to my first book launch, what outfit I would wear, everything else. Um, you know, when I, when I won a BAFTA, what, what would I wear that day? <laughs> and that procrastination lasted quite a long time before I'd actually written anything at all. So the key thing is to actually just read and write and then not worry about the business side of things until much later, until you've actually got something down that you're really proud of and that's been worked on really hard. Hi, Christy. Um, can you actually see us? Can you see can the audience? I can see Bella right now. I can okay. see Bella right now. Because um, I can see the audience. I, I'm a bloke, and I'm one of very few blokes in this audience. So <laughs> I hope this isn't going to be a token blokes question. Um, 
Thank you very much, both of you, actually, because Bella did a great fill-in job, but it's been fascinating to listen to you. Um, this isn't thanks to speaker, by the way. Um, emotional intelligence <clears throat> is a phrase that I only encountered four years ago. Um, and I think that's a bit of a bloke problem, actually. Um, but I think this last 15 months has been a real eye-opener for all of us, both pluses and minuses. And the question I'm interested in asking you is, given that um, a lot of men have been working from home and, and actually perhaps taken the opportunity to reconnect with their families in a way they would never otherwise have done, I want to look at the positives. And what I'm interested in is, is COVID and its consequences just a passing phase that we're very quickly going to forget? Or can we take the positives out of it and build on it? And if so, I'm interested in what your role is in that and how we can promote better practices, better family connections and all, all the positives and forget the negatives. Um, what a great question. Um, I love the word bloke. You don't really hear that, hear that much from me now. <laughs> I love the word bloke. Um, I think that, yes, I think it's been a really interesting time, not just for men, but for women and all, all families to, it's been, like you said, it's been good and it's been really hard as well. I don't think that we'll ever forget. I don't think we should ever forget the negatives. And I think that we are really at the end of the beginning in many ways in terms of a search for meaning into what this is about or has been about. And of course, we need to mourn collectively and all of us in whatever situation we're in, whatever country we're in, have been through something really significant and it's been really, really hard. And so I think people need to grieve and need to mourn in whatever circumstances they have. But there are positives and there is a, a there is a chance for conscious optimism moving forwards. And I think that it really has made people reassess and it feels like we're at a vantage point, a tipping point, a midpoint where we've all climbed a huge mountain and we're now looking back at what was and looking forward at what could be. And we're not quite sure what that looks like yet, but we've got a possibility to change things. And what I want to see is us not going back to how it was before because how it was before wasn't actually great. You know, we were suffering from various other pandemics, loneliness, existential fears, threats to democracy, racism, poverty, inequality. People were suffering greatly before. And so I don't think that it's a time for us to think we want to get back to normal. Maybe it's a time to think about what a new normal could look like and how we can reconnect with our families, communities, reassess what our values are, reassess things like what it means to be a bloke and what it means to be a woman. And I, I guess my role in this, I'm always thinking, I'm always thinking of that exact question. That's probably the biggest question of my life, actually. So that was pretty profound, but I'm always thinking, what is my role in this? And my role, I think, is scribe and when you when you do resuscitation for example in nursing there's always the scribe the person that writes the things down and the scribe is seen as the worst possible job it's not very sexy it's not very exciting it's usually given to the person with the least experience but i think it's a really really important job and my role i guess in this and in life is to is to write down stories and get those details down in order that I can make sense of things, but also hopefully other people might make sense of things in the detail as well. So thanks for that question. Thank you, Christy. Um, I'm conscious um, how your thinking is so relevant to and, and, and reflected in everything I hear from, from young people. And I, I share your optimism about this being a cusp and there being a change in values back to connections and family and the community. And, and I just want to thank you very much for actually being ahead of the curve almost on that and using 
COVID again to reiterate the importance of supporting people who live in isolation, uh, uh, supporting people who are sick and vulnerable. And uh, nurses, we know, will ensure that uh, no person will ever die alone. Uh, and I know that is one of the things you say in your book, that perhaps in the future we will hang our heads in shame that so many people died alone during COVID and perhaps this is one of the things we got wrong. And I do hope that we look at that and I share your sentiment. Um, in closing, have we got any further questions? And Christy, just on behalf of all of us, want to thank you for your lifetime of love and service to uh, the community. And I'm delighted that you've been able to find some time and uh, to, to put it all down. And I hope that you've encouraged other people to put their experiences down. And then it is on record for us to refer to, to influence, to culture shift, do all the things that we need to do as a movement, as a collective. You talk about collective, being a collective, and collective endeavor, common purpose, shared values. Um, and I really want to acknowledge that you're probably forefront in that movement in nursing. And thank you um, for sharing a little bit of your morning with us this morning, but we will have these books and we will, we will read them and we will pass them to friends and we will carry on making sure that we have the courage to care in our own families and communities. And thank you for influencing that. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and I look forward to coming to Guernsey in person one day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. You look so cheerful. <laughs> See, before you go, just on behalf of the Guernsey Literary Festival, I wanted to say a very big thank you for, for joining us today. I'm sorry about the technical hiccup, but um, we, 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 it was a wonderful talk and really, really insightful and inspirational. And thank you to Bella for chairing today and for standing in. Um, unfortunately, Christy obviously can't sign the books today, but we are, we are selling your books. We have a bookstall at the back of the room, Christy. So um, if you'd like to buy Christy's book, um, please do so after this talk. We have two more talks coming up this afternoon, one with Francesca Simon at 2.30, and then another talk with um, Joanne Harris at, at 5, 5.30 today. So if you haven't got tickets and would like to join us for those, you can buy tickets today. Thank you again, Christy. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for coming.